Come on up. Excellent. Dave is such an energetic guy. He didn't want to sit down. Oh, do you want to sit down now? Yeah, yeah I'll pull a chair. Oh, you do want to sit? Okay, we'll, we'll pull up a chair. All right. We could be some time, so we may as well. We may as well sit down. Um, now, for those who don't know Dave, I thought a good, uh, a good introduction would be uh, one of the professional highlights of Dave's whole career. We've got 90 seconds of it on YouTube. Uh, can we roll tape? And uh, let's see the glorious Southampton taking on Man U and defeating them 3-1. Let's have a look. Come up with a conjuring trick or two there. Chipoli! Chipoli goes for the cross. Oh, Schmeichel's lost it. Matt Letizier! If you're seeing a team now in a different strip, officially we're told it's because the United players couldn't uh, spot each other well enough. It's a good run from him. Carl Giggs! I think at home, I think we've been, um, the spectators have been magnificent for a kickoff all season. I mean, they've really got behind the team and got behind me. And I really didn't want a, a half time, to be honest. We, we pushed on to United, we worked hard, and I thought we retained the ball and passed the ball well. So you're remaining very calm through all this tense uh, period, Dave. Uh, are you really that way underneath it all? I am really. I, to be honest, I've looked at it and I thought, well, I've done all my work during the week. And you get to Saturday and you think, well, I can't see the point of worrying about it now. So it's really up to the lads and, and fairness to them. And I've said it all season, they've been brilliant for me. They've worked hard, technically in training, and I couldn't have asked any more of them. And you get to Saturday and you send them out over the white line and you whip them up and you just hope you can keep them going. You certainly did today. Well done, Dave. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Very good. So that was 1996 and you don't look a day older. Oh. You really don't. 1996, and what, would you say that was one of the, the highlights of your professional career? Well, I certainly look younger on me. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I would say so. I mean, I've, over many years, I've been in the game for over 40 years before I retired and started doing some work with BBC. And uh, that was one of the, the, the good moments. Mm. And uh, one of the funny parts about that game was at half-time, the United players went into the dressing room and said to Alex, uh, we need to change the strip gaffer. <laughs> and he said, well, why? He said, we can't see each other. So they changed the strip yeah. from grey to the, to the one in the second half. But we still won. Yeah. So it didn't make any difference. Excellent. But it was a highlight. Yeah. It was a highlight. And, uh, and John Motson there was, was saying that uh, uh, you seemed very, very calm. And, and that's, that's kind of what people say about you as, as a manager. It was, it's a very high pressure job, but you did manage to, to keep you calm. How did you do it? I think during that period of time, um, when I got the job, uh, Alan Ball had moved to Man City. And uh, the chairman got me in and said, uh, Dave, the good news is you've got the job. The bad news is there's no money. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was a pressure. Right. Because trying to stay in the Premier League, you can imagine, um, I don't think there's been anybody else in, in the Premier League probably where they've had a situation like that, where they've been asked to stay in the Premier League what the chairman did say, he said, if you can keep us in the Premier League, probably next season we'll have about 11 million to spend um, with the TV money. What um, year is this when you first This came? is uh, 96. 96, 95, yeah. 96. Mm. And uh, which we achieved. But mm. that, that was, out of 40 years, that was the hardest, hardest job I've ever done. Let me tell you why. Because you go in every day and you want to motivate the players from Saturday to Saturday. You look back at last Saturday, how you played. You've got to sort out your week and prepare for the next Saturday, but you've got to motivate your players. And if you can't introduce anybody new during the season into the dressing room, where it gives the dressing room a lift and the press and everybody on it, you've got to find a way technically to motivate your players week in and week out. And I have to say, the players themselves were brilliant. I had a good group of players. We brought them through the ranks. Probably two thirds of them had come through the ranks, and uh, they were great guys. And uh, they worked extremely hard. But the other thing, in answer to your question, is what you can't do 
during a situation like that is put any pressure on your team. You have to keep the pressure off your team and you do everything you can to keep the pressure away. You don't talk about relegation. You don't talk about being in the, the lower half. You talk about the next game and you set, you set little stores, you set little challenges. For instance, you might say, which I did, I would put up in the dressing room, three matches, little league, and I'd go, come on, get your money out, put your money where your mouth is. How many, how many points are you going to get out of these three games? And the players loved it, but they responded. So you're constantly, from a psychological point of view, looking to motivate your players and find different ways of, of working with them. So you had to be a psychologist as oh, well as a, a, as a coach. Oh, I would say a trick, a trick, a trick psychologist, <laughs> to, 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 to be honest. You've got to have everything. Yeah. You've got to have, you've, you've got to be ha you have eyes in the back of your head, uh, dealing with players. Mm. You've got to have a sense of humor. Mm. And let me tell you a funny story while it's running through my mind. This is when I was a player. This is the players are, are, are different animals to handle. They're different again today because money dictates everything. They're multi-millionaires. But when I was playing, players were, were tough and they were aggressive. And we were in the medical room one day and I had an ankle injury. And a lad called Gordon Taylor, who was uh, from Nottingham, a very tough, tough lad. And uh, he had a thigh injury, a hamstring. And the physio, little guy, lovely guy, very intelligent guy. He, uh, he'd uh, been in charge of three hospitals. And he put him on the diathermy machine. And this diathermy machine, you plugged it in, and it was a coil that went round your leg. But underneath the coil, you had a blanket and you had a towel before you put the coil round. And Jimmy, the physio, you put the machine on. Turned it on, 20 minutes, and Gordon sat there reading the paper, and ding, 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 off went the bell, and uh, he come over, time was up, Gordon folded his paper, and he went, this treatment's rubbish. Hmm. And the physio went, you what? He said, I'm the medical man in here. Don't you tell me my job. He said, you stick to football and I'll stick to the medical side. And he said, anyway, how do you know it's, it's not working? He says, because you put it on the wrong leg. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to have a sense of humor when you're dealing with players. So was, was football always a great passion of yours? What, what, what are your earliest memories of football? Well, being a Geordie, I was brought up in the Northeast and uh, the family was split. One side were red and white, Sunderland, and one side were black and white. And we were the black and white side. My, my father uh, was a welder. He worked for the British Oxygen Company, traveled around uh, the UK. But on a Saturday, we would try and get uh, to watch Newcastle in those days. Newcastle had 62,000 people every, every home game. And when you went there as a boy, as I did, you would get there, my father would be at the back, and they would pick you up mm. and pass you down the crowd, <laughs> and you would sit on the track all the way around. They wouldn't do it today, mm. but it was fantastic. I'll bet, I'll bet. So what, what were your memories of growing up? Uh, a happy home? Yeah, I was very fortunate. I was very blessed and uh, in a loving home. Um, the early years we lived in with my grandmother and grandfather because the, in those days there, wa there wasn't many houses before my mum and dad got a house. Um, it wasn't a Christian household, but it was a very loving, caring household. So if I'd have asked you, you know, who is Jesus, if you're age 15 and I ask you, who, who do you think Jesus is? What would you have said at that stage, do you think? Well, I was fortunate that... When I was a child of about five or six, the next door neighbors were Sunday, Sunday school teachers um, at a Wesleyan chapel. And they said to my mother, would you like me, would you like us to take David? And I went there for, for some time as a child. And I always remember them singing the choruses. But once I got into my teens, the, the Church of England and the school I went to, which was connected to the Church of England, they had a youth club on a Friday evening. And we seemed to all go there. They had snooker, table tennis. It was mixed, boys and girls. And in the schoolyard, we played five a side. 
and uh, a lot of my friends went there simply because of, of it being a good youth club. But what they did, the people who ran the youth club encouraged you to come to church. And that was my first experience, really, of, of going to church. Okay, and you, you, so you were thinking about Christian things. You wouldn't have called yourself a Christian necessarily, or looking back now, you realize you, you weren't uh, committed to Jesus at that stage, but it was, it was a part of your life. How, how would you describe your, your, sort of your Christianity at that stage? When I was 15, um, because I, I was playing for the county in one one thing or another. There was a number of scouts came to the club, different different football clubs, wanted me to join uh, their their club. And I finished up signing. My father finished up taking me to Burnley because he thought that would be the best place. In those days, um, we were, we're going back some years now to the 60s, early 60s, and uh, Burnley produced a lot of young players. And uh, he felt that would be the best place uh, for me to go and that's where I went and uh, during that period of time it was a very family orientated club uh, good coaching and you come through the ranks and I eventually got into the first team at 19 mm. and one weekend I, my grandmother who had been responsible a part of responsible for bringing me up she was a, a lovely lovely uh, Jody woman and she'd been a nurse in the pit. See, I was brought up, uh, there were mining villages and pit villages in the Northeast then. And uh, most people went into the mines as electrician or whatever it was. My father was lucky, he was a welder. But because I was in sport, it was an opportunity for me uh, to make a different type of living. So I was in Burnley and my grandmother uh, got seriously ill she got a tumor in the breast. And this woman was a, was a beautiful, lovely Geordie lady. She'd been a nurse in the pit. And she'd seen many, many accidents, mm. many backfires in the pit. So she'd seen lots of problems. And they took the breast off. In those days, they didn't have the medical uh, expertise that they've got now. And the scar was horrendous right round. But, you know, I never heard that lady moan or complain and I went back one weekend and uh, she was in bed by this time she was staying with my mother my mother was looking after her and uh, I went up to the room and in the room was a curate from the Church of England he was reading and praying with her young guy uh, something like yourself really in a way and I, and I wondered what's this guy doing anyway he, he, he left and this was an experience on its own. My grandmother said to me, Dave, you know I'm dying. And I couldn't handle that. I couldn't handle that. This is someone that I thought the world of. This is a gentle, lovely lady who would give you her last hate me. And I said, no, 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 you, you, you'll get better. And she said, look, I know that God can heal me in the twinkle of an eye. Now, this woman's dying of cancer. Okay? This is courage. She's dying of cancer. And she's saying to me, God can heal me in the twinkle of an eye. But if he doesn't do it, I know where I am going. And she said, what about you? And I totally missed the point. And I said, well, I've just got in the first team, mm. you know? Mm. I'm, I'm making good progress now. Then. Mm. Totally missed the point. Left, come back to Burnley. Shortly later, the lady dies. Mm. Six months later, we're in Germany on tour. And on a Friday night, you weren't allowed out. Uh, because you had the game the next day and it was to stop you to get in any bother or having too much to drink. And players in those days were, 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 were quite, quite something else. And, uh, to say the least. Hmm. And, uh, Still are, yeah, to yeah, be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so, in the camp at that time, 
and there were very, very few people, I have to tell you, in football who were Christians at that time. But we had a guy called Joe Brown, beautiful, lovely Christian man. And sometimes on a Sunday night, we would see him as we were, I, I could be taking your girlfriend to the, the cinema or something like that. But in, in Burnley Town Centre, they would have an open air service. You'd have the Salvation Army, the, the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, the Church of England, the Baptist Church, Methodist, the Baptist. And they'd all get together and they'd have the music and they'd be singing away and Joe would be there. And you'd pass and he didn't, he, was not, he wasn't embarrassed at all. He'd wave as you went past and he'd be there singing with the chorus sheets. Lovely guy. Anyway, <laughs> this, this night, we asked Joe to come over. We were playing cards, and one of the guys said the, the conversation got around to religion. And one of the guys shouted, hey, Joe, come here. We, uh, we're having a debate here. We're having a, we're having a question time. He said, you're a Christian. What's it all about? What's it all about? And Joe came over and he said, he looked around the room and he went, see you fellas. He said, the man I follow loves you more than anybody will ever love you. And he's God. And he lifted his hands and he said, he's got five wounds for you. In you, in you, because he loves you more than anybody will ever love you. <laughs> and he walked away, didn't say anything else. Wow. And I'm sitting there and I thought, boy, my grandmother came to my mind and Joe came to my mind. Mm. And I thought, mm. there was something happening then at that moment inside of me. And I didn't know what it was, but I didn't get any peace. And six months went by. And we're doing a training session. We come off, off the field and we're going up to the changing rooms to get changed. And Joe, Joe was in front of me. And I called out to Joe and I said, hey, Joe, I said, you remember six months ago? I said, when we're in Germany, he said, yeah. He said, Dave, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for the truth, Joe, but what's the truth? Now, I'm going to stop here, and I'm okay. going to work under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, if you're not a Christian tonight, just bear with me. And if you are Christian and I start getting excited. <laughs> he said to me, do you have a Bible? And I said, yeah. He says, do you read it? I said, are you having a laugh? I said, no, I don't. Now I'm going to stop there and I'm going to tell you a little story. Many years ago, there was a guy driving his car down a dusty road and it conked out and it spluttered and it stalled. So he gets out, lifts a bonnet, tries to mess about, can't get it going. Tries everything. Along the road comes a limousine, beautiful car, big car, posh car, big American car. Pulls up, the chauffeur gets out, he opens the door. Let's the guy in the back out. Man's terrifically dressed, beautiful overcoat. And he says to the guy, what's your problem? He said, can't get my car to go. He said, well, let me see if I can fix it. And he looks at him and he thinks, are you joking? Couldn't quite grasp that this man in this big car with his posh clothes on wanted to help him. And he thought, he's got no chance. I can't bend it. He can't bend it. So he persisted. Anyway, the guy goes over, 
takes his overcoat off, moves the wires, pushes the plugs and tightens the, the plugs up. And he says to the guy, will you try and start it up now? Boom, fires up straight away. Look, I can't believe it. Afterwards, the guy puts his overcoat on, he's getting in his car, and the guy who so delighted with him, he said, look, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't thank you enough. He said, do you mind if I ask your name? He said, certainly, Henry Ford. <laughs> Henry Ford had produced that motor car. Now, the reason I've told you that story was because part of this testimony I'm trying to share with Glenn and yourself is this. To understand the true picture and the full picture of what Glenn and I are trying to do tonight and I'm trying to say to you tonight and what God has to say to you tonight. John's gospel, at the beginning of John's gospel, God works in some wonderful, wonderful ways. You've got to understand the full picture. It's a similar picture to the one I've just told you about and the story I've just told you. And we need to go back to the very beginning because at the beginning of John's gospel, it says this, in the beginning was the word. You see, it takes us back to the beginning of time. Before time existed. We live in a time scale. Hey, my days are running out. Yours are all before you. I'm in the last furlong. But you see, like my grandmother, I know where I'm going now. Now, John's pointed out, beginning of time, how the stars were hung out. The earth was put in together. And when you look at John's gospel right at the beginning, and then you jump back right to the beginning of the Bible, and this is what excites me about being a Christian. And make no doubt about it, when you get to know Jesus, he is the best coach and motivator you will ever meet. And I mean that. In Genesis, at the beginning of Genesis, in the first chapter, God speaks the word and he brings everything into being. The earth, the atmosphere, the seas, the animals. And in that first chapter, he speaks 10 times. 10 times. You see, John, John got to know Jesus personally. Jesus comes through time, from before time, into time, through the Old Testament, into the New Testament. So the way he was yesterday, and the way he was in the Old Testament, and the way he is in the New Testament, and the way he is today, he hadn't changed a bit. He is still the same person. You see, my grandmother and Joe and John, the Apostle John, let me throw this at you. What did they have in common? My grandmother, I've told you the story. I've told you the story of Joe. I've told you a little bit about John the Apostle. Those three people had something in common that I didn't have. You know what it was? They knew him personally. They knew him personally. I didn't have that. I didn't have that. You see... When, when Joe gave me that piece of scripture as I'm coming off the training ground, he said, have you got a Bible? 
He said, Dave, do me a favor. Go and read John chapter 3. It's about a man like you. He's a bit older than you. But he's seeking the same thing as you are, the truth. He said, now promise me you'll go and read John chapter 3. You see, Nicodemus, if you know anything about the Bible, or this little story, was a top guy. He was a religious leader. He was actually an intellectual. He knew the scriptures inside out. Why would a guy like this go during the night to see Jesus? You've got to answer that question yourself. I've got my own thoughts and ideas. But when he got there, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. When Nicodemus got there, Jesus looked at him and he saw the potential inside of him. And he's seeing the potential inside of you tonight. And you. And you. And you. And what he's saying to you is, I love you. I love you. And I have traveled through time and space for you and for you. And I hung on a wooden cross for you and you. And I sorted all this out at the beginning of time. The question is, is it true? That's the question we've got to ask. Is it true? And that was the question I had asked myself. You see, I've come to realize, having read that chapter over and over about Nicodemus, that was me. I was searching. And I reached out my hand and I said, Lord, if you are who you are, come into my life. Help me to go your way rather than my own way. Best decision I ever made. And I'd say without hesitation tonight, a qualification that knowing Jesus is the joy of my life. I've been in football for 40 years and I've had some cracking times. But let me tell you this, folks. Nothing, nothing compares to knowing Jesus personally. When he comes into your life, no spark went on. There was no flashing of lightning or anything like that in my life. But as time has gone by, he's molded me. He's shaped me. He sat me down. He's picked me up when the pressure was on. And you're going to be under pressure because of your exams. You're going to be under pressure when you go into the real world and you start to work. Who are you going to do it with? Are you going to do it in your own strength? Or are you going to do it with the Lord who wants to help you? I made a conscious decision to follow Jesus. And I've been doing that now since I was 19. And you know what? It's got better and better and better. It's more exciting now than it's ever been. For me to be here tonight, then I can't emphasize this enough. For me to be here tonight, to speak to you young people, it is exciting. It is thrilling. It's terrific. Do you know why? You, you are tomorrow's people. You are Jesus' disciples of tomorrow and today. You will carry the flag. You will stand on the rock. He's asking you. 88% of 
of people today don't go to church. What about that one, eh? 88%. You Christians here tonight, you are the army that will carry tomorrow. What a privilege. What a privilege. What a privilege for me tonight to be able to share his love with you. To be able to tell you who he is, what he's done in my life, what he can do in your life. What he's saying to you tonight is let me go into your profession with you. Let me walk with you through life. You see, we're all on a journey. Each one of us here tonight is on a journey, and it's a journey into eternity. You've got to stop and think about that one. So, Dave, let me, let me ask you some questions about how this works out in the, in the nitty-gritty of your life. So age 19 was a massive shift for you. So this is you coming to see, you read in John chapter 3, there's that, that wonderful verse that says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And you read this, and I, and I guess it's, it becomes personal for you. It's sort of God so loved Dave that he gave his one and only son. Can you, can you just walk us through how did, how did it make you a different player to begin with? How, how, how does knowing Jesus transform life on the football pitch? I, I don't think it matters what job you're in or what profession you're in. You've got to make a decision on how the structure of your life is going to be. Are you going to do it in your own strength, in your own way? There's two teams in life. I think I might have said this to you on the telephone mm -hmm. when I spoke to you. There's two teams in life, and I'm, I'm working off the top of my head now. There's God's team, and there's the world's team. You've got to decide what team you're going to play in and what coach you're going to work under. One's called Satan. One's called Jesus, right? When you go into your profession, you've got to, you've got to decide, as I had to do, how am I going to do and perform? And what I realized was that to be a good pro, I wanted to hand everything over to the Lord. So when I went into training, yeah, I wanted to train hard. Yes, it was tough. Yes, I was an aggressive player. But I channeled my energies. And I wanted God to be in it. I wanted to glorify God in what I was doing. Now, if you turn out to be a solicitor, an accountant, or a doctor. Now, are you going to do that in your own strength and walk that way yourself? Or are you going to do it to the glory of, you, of the person who made you? That's how I would mm. define it. And then how, how about stresses in life? I mean, being a Premier League manager is, is one of the most stressful jobs that anyone can imagine. Uh, and especially you come into the Premier League and you're told you have no money and you have to stay up. And at the same time, I think in, in that same season, uh, is it true that your, your wife was going through all sorts of health issues? She had aneurysms, ble bleeds on the brain. Uh, incredible amounts of pressure come on you. Uh, what difference does knowing Jesus make in, in that? I think we all, we are all going to have our ups and downs in life. The one thing, when you become a Christian, don't get the wrong idea that it's all going to be a, a garden of roses. It isn't. You're going to have your ups and downs like everybody else. You're no different to anybody else. And if you're a, Christ, if you're a Christian here tonight, you need to, to get that in your head. You're going to have ups and downs, and there's going to be problems. But the great thing is, Jesus said, I love you. I won't leave you, and I won't forsake you. I'll be with you in the good times and the bad times. And you see, his goal and his target is to get you home. Hmm. It's to get you home. Hmm. We're talking eternity of where you're going to spend eternity. You know? And when I was doing the job, right at the end of the season, I came under tremendous pressure. My wife was seriously ill and in intensive care. 
she'd had a double breed, a double bleed in the brain. And if you know anything about the brain, it's a, there's a membrane that goes over the, over the brain. And if the bleed drops into the brain, it becomes more serious. But there was a great deal of prayer went out. And I genuinely believe God healed her. Because nine times out of ten, the surgeon has to go in and clip what they call clip these little blood vessels. And that didn't happen. There was little side effects afterwards, but she came through it. But in those last two games of the season, my wife is in intensive care. So put yourself in that position. One day you might be in that position in life with a loved one. And you're handling the pressure of your job. And you're handling the pressure of your faith and belief that I could have lost my wife. But at least if she'd have gone, I would have known where she was going. But God was very gracious and brought us through. And it's that type of pressure that I think your faith, if you hold fast and you keep believing. And sometimes the more I walk with them, the less I understand them, and the more I've got to trust them. Mm. And that was a, a set of circumstances where I had to put my hand in his and just trust him. Mm. I asked you back when you were 15 what you would have made of Jesus back then. Uh, you've known him now for, gosh, 50 plus years. So who is Jesus to you today? How would you explain who Jesus is? Let me gather my thoughts on this one. Hmm. King of kings, Lord of lords, creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in it. You know, Jodrell Bank of finding new stars and new galaxies. And he put them together. He's my best friend. Hmm. He's someone I can sit with in the car and have him in the passenger seat and I can talk to him. And if somebody was passing and they saw me talking to this person who's not really there in the car, they would think I was a loopy. But that's what prayer is. Mm -hmm. You see, I believe Jesus, when you wake up in the morning, how many of you wake up in the morning? I do. And I go, good morning, Lord. It's another day. Let's get going. No matter what it has in store, let's do it together. That's how exciting. That's what Jesus means to me. Mm -hmm. You see, it's something that's real. When you get up in the morning, it's some, he's a person you take into work. You share friendship with, with other people. You introduce him. And people have to see that in you. And I believe a real Christian, sometimes you might not say anything, but they'll know that Jesus is living through you. Mm, very good. I pray in the car too. I don't close my eyes, but I do pray in the car. Um, that's an important one. Let me, let, me ask you, let me ask you one last question. I'm sure you can roll some of that into, into your last answer. Um, this is a week where people are being introduced to Jesus, perhaps for the first time, and uh, people are, are being shown uh, the glory and the greatness of Jesus and, and perhaps asked to follow him. And uh, I just wonder what advice you would have for anyone who's here tonight and they're just investigating Jesus, what, what advice would you give to someone looking into the Christian faith? Um, the reason I keep on the move is because it's habit. I'm a football coach <laughs> and I, I, I can't get rid of those, those instincts. You move and you work with people, you motivate people, so you're constantly on the move. And you've never got to be afraid to look in people's eyes. You know why? 
Because the eyes are the mirror of the soul. See, I could look into a player's eyes and I could go, you were out last night. And you, <laughs> and you were on a bevy. <laughs> so I knew what I had to do with him. I did. <laughs> you know, I knew that he, he was going to need a worker. But <laughs> let me say this to you. There's a couple of things I, I, I'd like to, to say to you. There was a man called Reg Dean. And this has stuck with me from the day I heard it. Reg Dean was 110 years old. And if you're not a Christian here tonight, listen to this one. He's 110 years old and he's as sharp as a button. And the interviewer from TV went to interview him and he said, what do you think the most important question has been in your life? And this guy at 110 said, who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? And if you're not a Christian tonight, boy, you better work them ones out. Because it's going to be so important in your life. Meryl Streep, the actress, the American actress, who's a very, very good actress, in one of her movies said this. We are the people of the decisions we make. We are the people of the decisions we make. And you know what? We make good and bad decisions. That illustration was saying again, two teams. And I would say it here tonight. Life is so short. Boy, I can remember the day I left home at 15 years of age to go to Burnley. And my life is well on its way over now. Take the time. Joe Brown said to me in that group, that, that card group, he went, he's worth 10 minutes of your time. And I would say to you tonight, if you're not a Christian here tonight, Listen to what Glenn has to say to you tonight. Just listen. Open your ears and open your heart. If you don't make a decision tonight, go away and find out what's the truth. Is he real or is he not? And I am going to guarantee you something. If you take them into your heart tonight or tomorrow or in 20 years time, it will be the best thing you have ever done. And that, you know, Jesus said two things, two very interesting things. Can I finish on this? Go on then. Who am I? To the disciples. Who do people say I am? Who am I? And they went, well, some of them are saying you're John the Baptist. Some of them are saying you're Elijah. And others are saying you're one of the prophets come back. And they went, right. You see, he was testing them. But his next question was, but what about you? Jesus is saying that tonight. If you don't know, he's saying tonight, what about you? Who do you think I am? Now you're either for and playing on his side or you're against him. He also said this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now he's either stark, raven, balmy, or he is who he said he is. Those are great words to finish on. Dave Merrington, thank you so much. Will you be uh, available afterwards yep. if people want to, want to talk Certainly. to you? Fantastic. Should we get, show our appreciation for Dave Merrington? Thanks so much. <laughs> do you want to take a comfy seat there and I'll, I'll preach from here? That's fantastic. Thank you so much.
Brilliant. Well, I just want to take a couple of minutes uh, to introduce you to this Jesus that uh, Dave has been speaking of. And to, to do it, I just want to draw your attention to these books. Uh, it says Uncover on the front. Actually, it is Mark's gospel. Here is one of the biographies of Jesus. You might know that the New Testament kicks off with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these four biographies of Jesus' life. And I just want to introduce you to just, just a couple of sentences uh, beginning on page eight. And I want to introduce you to this Jesus who Dave has been speaking about. On uh, page eight, you'll see about three quarters of the way down the page, there's a little heading, Jesus calls Levi and eats with sinners. It's a story of Jesus coming into planet Earth to call people. And you know, there's there's a great trade-off in life between uh, meaning on the one hand and being under authority. I wonder if you've ever thought about that before. Uh, I don't know what you think the meaning of life is, but if I said to you, uh, please meet me here at this church tomorrow at 3 p.m., uh, what's your first question going to be? If I say, please please meet me tomorrow at 3 p.m. here at Highfields Church, what are you going to ask me? You're going to ask me, why? And what if I answer you, oh, no reason, no reason at all, just will you show up? And you're going to say, well, are you going to be there? haven't decided yet, but will you please show up at 3 p.m.? And you'll say, well, what's the meaning of it all? I I, I don't know what the meaning is. You make up the meaning. Why don't you show up at 3 p.m. tomorrow and you can just do whatever you want? That will be meaningful, won't it? Who's going to show up at 3 p.m. tomorrow? Absolutely nobody, right? Because you need a reason in order to give up just an hour of your life, don't you? You, you, you're not going to give up an hour of your life unless there's a really good reason for using that hour of life meaningfully, right? And yet what's fascinating to me is that so many of us spend 700,000 hours of our life and we have no, no, have no idea what the meaning is. We show up here on planet Earth and, and we don't know why we're here. We don't know the meaning. We don't know the purpose. We don't know the significance. And we think to ourselves, well, I'll just make it up as I go along. Well, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be better if there was a meaning, a purpose, a significance? Wouldn't it be better if, if there was a reason for you to be here? But of course, there's a trade-off between that meaning and the authority that someone else has over your life. You see, if I say show up tomorrow at 3 p.m. because I am going to lead a wonderful afternoon of, I don't know, five-a-side football, who knows? Well, I'm going to lead that hour of your time, well, there's a trade-off, isn't there? I'll be in charge of that hour, but it will be a meaningful hour. You'll have to surrender some of your autonomy in order to come in on the meaning of the three o'clock meeting. And it's the same with life. If I say to you, there is a meaning to this world, there's a meaning to the 700,000 hours of your life. There really is a meaning to it all, but you've got to surrender your autonomy because there's someone who's in charge of this world. There's someone who's in charge of life. He gives a direction to this world. There is a grain to this universe. And if you go against the grain, you're going to get splinters. But if you go with the grain, there is, there is meaning, there is significance, there is purpose. But there's a trade-off because to the degree that you acknowledge meaning in the world, you also need to acknowledge authority in the world, that there's someone outside this world who knows what this world is about, who knows what life is about and therefore who knows what your life is about. And you think, well, that sounds like bad news. I, I, I don't want there to be someone like that. Well, what if the someone in charge of this world is like this? What if he's Jesus? What if Jesus is Lord? What if he's the one who is in charge of planet Earth? I think that would be a phenomenal truth. So we're just seeking to introduce you to this Jesus who, as Dave has said, stands outside time and space and yet has entered into time and space to give us meaning and purpose and significance and to give us authority in life. I'm going to give you three pictures of Jesus just from this passage. Jesus is the commander in chief. He's the master of the banquet and he's the spiritual doctor. That's what we're about to see in this story. And first of all, he's the commander in chief. Let's have a look at verse 13. Little number 13 means it's verse 13, sentence number 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Do you see the authority 
here with Jesus. He truly is a commander in chief. He truly comes to planet earth and what he says goes. You remember the old uh, pictures, Lord Kitchener during World War I with the finger pointed straight at the, straight at the viewer of the poster saying, I want you, right? That's, that's Jesus, this, this person of supreme authority. We don't know what else he said to Levi. I'm sure many people went up to Levi and they said all sorts of things because Levi was a tax collector. And that means that he was a collaborator with the hated Romans. He was a white collar criminal, stealing far too much money from his own people and giving it to the hated Romans. Many people would have gone up to Levi and they would have had two words for him. But Jesus' two words were very, very different. He just says, follow me. It's extraordinary, really. Levi here has a name change. He goes on to be called Matthew. And you might know that the New Testament kicks off with Matthew's gospel. Matthew is one of the 12 disciples. He goes from being an utter scumbag to being one of the authors of the founding document of Western civilization. That's quite a turnaround, isn't it? How does he go from being somebody who is just derided and demeaned and slandered in the community to being one of the pillars of Western civilization? How, how does he... How did he go from being a tax collector to being one of Jesus' followers? Well, just two words from Jesus. Just two words from Jesus have the power to turn him around. And you think to yourself, well, what does Jesus promise him here? And it it, it doesn't look like Jesus is promising him anything. He doesn't say, follow me and I'll make you rich. He doesn't say, follow me, I'll make you prosperous. Follow me, I'll make you healthy. He doesn't promise him anything. He just says, follow me. And, and, you know, the one thing Levi will get if he follows Jesus is Jesus. But if Levi has his head screwed on right, the one thing he will need and the one thing he will truly want in life is Jesus. And so Levi got up and followed him. He, he left, left behind a life of financial security. He left behind a financial cushion. He left behind the life that he knew. And now what is he being ushered into? What's the new life that Jesus is offering him? Uh, Well, we don't know. We don't know. But wherever he will go, he will now go with Jesus. And that's enough for Levi. And that's been enough for Dave throughout his life. You know, when, when Jesus came into Dave's life, Jesus did not promise him health and wealth and prosperity. Jesus just promised himself And Dave's here to tell you that that's enough. To have Jesus through the storms of life is better than any mountaintop experience without Christ. And so here is Jesus, the the commander-in-chief. And I I wonder if Jesus came into this room this evening and he said, follow me. Would you do it? If he came in the flesh this evening and he just said, come on, what would you do? Would you... Would you get up and follow him? Because you'd want to say, where are we going, Jesus? He doesn't say. What can I take with me? Oh, nothing. Where are we going? What are we doing? Can't say yet. But are you coming? What do you reckon? This Jesus is such a figure of towering personality and stooping love. His charisma has won billions to his side. I don't know, is he, is he winning your heart? Maybe this week you've started to see something about Jesus and you've started to think to yourself, yeah, I, I think he's worth following. I remember I was 21 years old reading through the Gospels. It was Luke's Gospel in particular. His biography of Jesus captured my heart. I just saw who Jesus was in Luke's Gospel. And I just thought, this Jesus, who he's absolutely blistering against the religious hypocrites. And then he's just so caring and loving towards the weak and the marginalized. He can turn on a dime. He's just... He brings the proud low and he lifts up the, whole, uh, the, the, the lowly and the humble. And you think to yourself, who is this Jesus? He's, he's astonishing and he has all the authority to come to planet Earth and just say, okay, do you want me in your life? I will be your leader. I will be your Lord. Age 21, I just thought to myself, absolutely, you've won me. I looked at the kind of Lord who would stoop and serve and suffer and bleed and die for me. And I thought, I'm in. I'm in. How about you? Well, the story doesn't finish there because Jesus proves himself not just to be the commander in chief, but uh, over the page, you'll see he is also the, the master of the banquet. 
He's the banquet master. So over on page 10, right at the top of the page, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Well, because that's what he does. This is what the Lord of heaven does when he comes to planet Earth. He feasts with people. In fact, one of the great things that he says in Luke's gospel, chapter 7, verse 34, he says, I have come eating and drinking. What a mission statement, right? I've come eating and drinking. That's, that's what I'm all about. And if you read through the gospels, you'll just see on every page, Jesus is either at a dinner party or he's telling people how to throw better dinner parties or he's saying that heaven is a great dinner party. He's, he's just always eating and drinking. Wherever you find Jesus, he's always at a dinner party. He's always the master of the banquets. He's always the life and soul of the party. I wonder if you've encountered that about Jesus. You see, why would Levi just follow Jesus? Jesus says, just follow me. You know what? One of the answers that Levi could give, why should I follow Jesus, is he is a man of such joy, unbridled, overflowing, sparkling, dazzling joy. I've just got to be near him. And all these tax collectors and sinners, you know, other, other white-collar criminals and other scum-of-the-earth kind of sinners. There they are. They, they just they can't get enough of Jesus. They flock around Jesus. Have you, have you encountered this about Jesus, his magnetic personality? One person who really saw the magnetic personality of Jesus was Lord Hailsham. He writes about uh, why he became a Christian in these words. He says, the first thing we should learn about Jesus is that we should have been absolutely entranced by his company. Jesus was irresistibly attractive as a man. What they crucified was a young man, vital, full of life and the joy of it, the Lord of life itself and even more the Lord of laughter. Someone so utterly attractive that people followed him for the sheer fun of it. Why did Levi follow Jesus? One answer you could give is, for the sheer fun of it. Not that Jesus was offering an easy life. He wasn't. He was, he was saying to Levi, leave behind all your financial security. But as Levi does that, he's thinking, you know why I should do this? Ah, for the fun of it. Don't you just want to be with Jesus? Once again, if Jesus came in through those doors and just said, would you, would you be with me? Will you follow me? I hope you'd say, yeah, just for the fun of it. Just to be near this dazzlingly holy and joyful man. Someone so utterly attractive that people followed him for the sheer fun of it. Lord Halsham goes on. He says, we need to recapture the vision of this glorious and happy man whose mere presence filled his companions with delight. He would have the children laughing all around him and squealing with pleasure and joy as he picked them up. Can you picture it? That's the Jesus I've come to know. You know, Dave earlier was talking about how Jesus says he's the way and the truth and the life. And as he says, you know, if, if anyone mortal speaks in those terms, you might want to section them, right? They might, they might not be in the healthiest mental space if they make a claim like that. And yet Jesus makes those kinds of claims all the time. He's always saying, you know, I'm older than the universe. I brought all things into being. I'm the meaning of all existence. I'll wrap things up at the end of history. And if you want to know what God looks like, keep looking right here, people, which is an extraordinary thing to say, you know. If I, if I said to you afterwards over a cup of tea and I said, uh, yeah, yeah, you want to know what God looks like? Right here, people, right here. Right, yeah, you, <laughs> exactly. Laughable, ridiculous, stupid. And yet Jesus says it on like every page of the Gospels. What are, what are we meant to do with Jesus? You know, C.S. Lewis he has that great line. He's the author of the Narnia books. He said, you know, when Jesus makes these kinds of claims, he's forcing you down one of three roads. Either, if he says these things, he's either lying to himself, right? Which that, that would be an obvious conclusion to draw, wouldn't it? If, if he thinks he is God come to earth. Maybe he's lying to himself, right? Maybe he's not in his right mind. Either he's lying to himself or he's lying to you. He knows full well he's not God come to earth, but I don't know, he's maybe trying to get a sweet book deal or something, you know. Either he's lying to himself or he's lying to you. 
Either he's mad or he's bad. But if he's not mad and he's not bad, he's telling the truth. There is not a fourth option. There are only those three options. He's either lying to himself or he's lying to you. But if he's not lying to himself and he's not lying to you, he must be telling the truth, which means he, he must be God, right? He must be the God that you and I just dream about, imagine, come up with in our heads. But as C.S. Lewis does that, as he tries to force you down one of these three roads, you know, it, it, he doesn't think it would be a bad option to go with the Lord option. He, he doesn't think it would be a bad option to conclude that Jesus is Lord. He's not trying to get you with your arm up behind your back saying, all right, fine, he's Lord. Lewis and me and Dave and the Christians in this room, we happen to think it would be the most sensational news imaginable if God really was like Jesus. Wouldn't that be stunning? Wouldn't it be stunning if the God that everyone just talks about is the, the master of the banquet? The joyful, joy-giving God. Wouldn't that be astonishing? If the kind of God who there really is, is the kind of God who would come and, and he would feast with sinners. In fact, he'd keep on feasting all the way through the Gospels until, you know, the night before Jesus died, he's at another dinner party. There they are in the upper room. And he picks up bread. And he says, everyone, look at the bread. Look at the bread. Do you see the bread? Look at the bread. Look at the bread. And he tears it. And he says, this is my body. You know what he's saying, right? He's saying that his, his body is about to get torn apart. And then he picks up a glass of wine and pours the wine into it. And he says, everybody, look, 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 look. Do you see that, you see that claret just pouring out? He says, this is my blood. What's he saying? He's saying that his body is about to be broken on that cross and his blood is about to be spilled on that cross. So much does he want to invite you to the great feast. The feast that everything wraps up with. You know, the Bible ends with a great wedding feast. And that Those who have received Jesus, received the benefits of his death, at the end of all things, we get invited into the great banquet and we will toast the death of death. And we'll toast the Lord who brought it about, the master of the banquets. He went to that cross to pay for an entrance for all of us into that great banquet. Do you want to be there? He's died to get you there. Do you want to pull up a chair alongside the master of the banquet? Well, we're not finished. We've had the commander in chief. We've had the master of the banquet. And then we've got this question that's been hovering over the party. The religious policemen called the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they've been asking, why is Jesus hanging around with all the, you know, teachers, with all the tax collectors and the sinners? How's Jesus going to answer this? Verse 17, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Great answer, isn't it? Why is Jesus hanging around with all the wrong sorts of people? And Jesus says, well, I'm a doctor. It's kind of what doctors do. It's really funny, this scene. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they, they are gate-crashing this party. And then they're complaining about the guest list. It's a funny thing for a gate-crasher to do, don't you think? Like, if you gate-crash a party, maybe shut up about the guest list, Okay. But these religious policemen, they're, they're the ones with the binoculars and the clipboard trying to make sure that you're doing everything just right and putting a black mark next to your name. That's, that's what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were like. And they didn't think that Jesus was policing the boundaries of his table effectively. They, they, they thought he should not let the riffraff in. If he's Lord, he shouldn't let people like this into his table fellowship, into his kingdom. That's... That's, that's no way to, to, to execute the, the, the border security of the kingdom of God. What are you doing, Jesus? Why are you hanging out with all the wrong sorts of people? He says, well, that's what doctors do, isn't it? Don't know if you feel the same as me when you uh, feel sick. I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, an Australian man, and so I never go to the doctor. Right? Never, 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 never. I complain about every cough and cold like it is bubonic plague. Don't worry about that, right? But I never want to go to the doctor because you never want to feel like you're wasting their time. 
Don't you get that? You, you, you never want to go to the doctor and say, oh, it's just a little cough. I'm sure that, you know, because you're not meant to go to the doctor and say, hello, doctor, I'm a picture of perfect health. I, sure, I thought you'd be impressed, right? They won't be impressed. They'll kick you out, right? That's, that's why I, I, I wait until I've got at least 17 things wrong with me. You, you have the same list and you, you sort of go in and because you don't want the doctor to say, well, that's not a problem. That's not a problem. That's not a problem. You're wasting my time. Get out. Doctors are for sick people, right? And Jesus is for sinners, only for sinners. Now, this comparison between sin and sickness, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Jesus is kind of saying the human problem is a bit like a sickness. The selfishness at the heart of you and I, it is a bit like a sickness. You know, maybe it's a bit like chicken pox. You know, chicken pox, you get these horrible, blotchy, scratchy marks on you. Right, and, and, and you might think that the big problem with chickenpox is the surface level blotchiness, right? The discomfort, the itchiness. That, that's what's wrong with chickenpox, right? And, and if that is all that was wrong with chickenpox, then I guess, I guess you could just put some plasters on it or makeup or something. You could, you could, a bit of concealer. That would, that would solve the problem with chickenpox, wouldn't it? Except that the real problem with chickenpox is in the blood, right? It goes much deeper than that. And the Bible says that the problem with sin, the problem with our selfishness is a little bit like that. You think the main thing that is wrong with you is that thing that you said the other day to your friend and you can't believe you said it, right? And as soon as you said it, you thought to yourself, oh, I don't know what came over me. I'm so sorry, right? But of course, nothing came over you. It all came out of you, right? It all came out of somewhere very deep and dark, somewhere in your bloodstream, Somewhere right down in your bones, there's a, there's a sickness to you and I. And the, the bad things that we do, they're just the symptoms. They're just like the chicken pox. The real issue with you and I is it goes deeper. Jesus says later on in Mark's gospel that the bad stuff comes out of our hearts, right? Read about it in Mark chapter 7. What is evil comes from within, out of our hearts come evil thoughts, and then the rest of it comes out, spews out. That's what you and I are like. We, we are sick. You recognize it? You recognize that we're sick? If you do, you'll flock to the doctor. Of course you will. But if you don't, you'll be very much like, there, there are some older people in our congregation in Eastbourne. You might know that Eastbourne is like the, it is the, Retirement capital of the UK, basically. It, it, it's a place where all the, all the shop windows are bifocal. It's, it's that kind of place. It's, it's God's waiting room, essentially, is Eastbourne. And uh, I'm part of a church in Eastbourne. And there are a lot of older, older saints there. And uh, it is so difficult to get them to the doctor because they, they don't want to bother anyone. I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to be a bother. And as they say that, they are hacking up a, hacking up a lung into their lace hanky. And it's just it's like this blackness comes out of them. <clears throat> I'm fine. I'm fine. <clears throat> I don't want to be a bother. Right? And, uh, and you almost have to kidnap them to get them to hospital. Like you, you almost do. Like, like That is enough, Maureen. I'm just taking you. I'm just taking you to the doctor. And, and the trouble is, human beings, we're a bit like that, spiritually speaking, okay? All of us are hacking up a lung, right? <laughs> that last argument that you had, that last thing that you said to the person you say you love more than anyone else, well, why did you say the worst possible thing to the person you say you love the most? What's going wrong? You're hacking up a lung, spiritually speaking. We're, we're all doing it. And Jesus is saying, won't you see the doctor? Won't you see me? Jesus is a doctor for the sick, right? He's not interested in you pretending to be good. And, you know, churches are not places where you should pretend to be good. They're not meant to be like that. They're meant to be hospitals for sick sinners like you and me. You know, people sometimes ask me, you know, do I, do I believe in hell? Do I believe in that big stuff that Jesus speaks of? And I have to say, you know, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it, it does speak of heaven and hell. And, and even when I go outside the Bible, I go to all the religions of the world, and they seem to have this, this category for darkness and disintegration. They seem to have this category for a life that is anti-life, for a place of darkness and disconnection. 
Everyone seems to have a category for this. You, you go to a clinical psychologist like Jordan Peterson and he starts talking about, you know, life is just suffering tainted by malevolence and you can get stuck in hell. A clinical psychologists like, like Jordan Peterson will tell you that kind of thing. Everybody's got a category for this kind of thing, this, this sickness that you can get stuck in. But you know, the, there's good news here. The good news is when you realize you're sick, that qualifies you for the doctor. And when you start to realize that there's a problem inside you, there's a hellishness inside you, when you come to see that, that qualifies you from, for Jesus. It doesn't disqualify from you. It doesn't disqualify you from Jesus. It qualifies you to start to recognize, yeah, there's something in me which... If I don't get this thing sorted out, if I keep on hacking up a lung, spiritually speaking, then I will get stuck in this hellish reality. And you don't want to get stuck there forever. Everyone lives forever, says the Bible. You don't want to get stuck there forever. But no one needs to. Because this is why Jesus came. He went through that death. He came out the other side. And now he comes to us as a spiritual doctor. And he just says, don't bring me your goodness. Bring me your badness. Don't tell me your spiritual health. Tell me about your spiritual sickness. Just come to me and I will heal it. See, the Christian life is about gathering around a table as those who are sick sinners who have found healing in a doctor. Lost people who have found a Lord who can lead them. Joyless people who found the master of a banquet and life overflowing. Do you want this Jesus, this Jesus that transforms lives? Well, in a second, I'm just going to offer a prayer. It's really simple. It's just re really responding to these three aspects of who Jesus is. The, the, the three aspects. Jesus is the commander. So one thing you might want to say to Jesus is, Jesus, lead me. You are the commander, lead me. Then the second aspect of Jesus the master of the banquet. You are the master of the banquet, Jesus. Fill me. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your life. Fill me with your joy. And then that third aspect of Jesus, he's the doctor. And so we can pray, Jesus, forgive me and heal me. And really, that's just the most basic way you can respond to Jesus. It's the most basic way you can do what Levi did. To get up and follow Jesus, maybe just for the sheer fun of it, just because Jesus is worth it. Should we bow our heads and let me, let me lead you in that really simple kind of prayer? And it might be exactly the sort of thing that, that you'd like to do to respond to this Jesus. Let me lead you in a very simple prayer. You can echo the words in your heart. The words are not magic, but they might be a way of you responding to this Jesus. Lord Jesus, you are the commander. Lead me. Lord Jesus, you are the banquet master. Fill me. Fill me with your life, with your joy, with your spirit. Lord Jesus, you are the spiritual doctor. Forgive me and heal me. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that.